Hello and welcome back to another episode of Ask Textile History, where you ask stuff and I try to find the answers. Fish Computers, which fabulous name by the way, asks about the chemistry of natural dyes and how it works on a molecular level. And you know, this is quite a bit more complex than we might want to imagine made more so by the large number of different natural dyes who you know all have their own molecular structures and of course they all interact differently with our natural fibers who also all have different molecular structures so there is a lot of variation here and then of course you also are using it with or without a mordant to help our dye stick to its intended target so there's a lot here by the way Mordant comes from mordere in Latin, which means to bite, because we thought the mordant sort of bit into the textile fiber to make it easier for the dye to stick. Also, you asked about molecular level, so prepare to get chemical. At least two problems are prominent when we wish to dye a textile. First, we need to get our dye stuff into a watery solution, only for it to then prefer the textile fiber when we introduce that into the mix. Second, that dye stuff needs to keep preferring our textile fiber over time, ideally going insoluble in water so it doesn't just wash out the next time we do laundry. It also needs to be a stable molecule, otherwise, you know, UV radiation from the sun would just break it down and we would lose the color that way. To do this, dyes come as either direct dyes, meaning they can dye the fabric without the help of a mordant, or mordant dyes, meaning they need the help of a mordant to be color fast, meaning it doesn't leach out of our clothes, or to achieve the desired color intensity. I'm going to have to do this with specific examples, or we will just get bogged down with the generalities, I think. Also, because there is very little research into the mechanics of natural dyes at large, there is some, but not a whole lot. But we'll start with the natural dye that has had the most attention and the most you know, research gone into it, because it has also been the most important for several hundred years and has had huge economic implications, and that is indigo. Indigo is an excellent example of a direct dye, because rather than use a mordant to help us, we manipulate the chemical structure to get what we want. This is the molecular structure of indigo. You do need to ferment your indigo-containing plant to get to this molecule, but we have enough chemistry to go through in this episode, so I think we're going to start here. I am not going to quiz you on this later, but if you know nothing of chemical structures, suffice to say that this is a very stable molecule. It is pretty content to just hang out, do its own thing. There is a slight negative charge around the two oxygen atoms, but not enough that it wants to dissolve in water. You know, at all. So when we want this blue so dark it is almost black in its concentrated form to dye our clothes, we need to change it first. We do this with a strong alkali, such as sodium hydroxide or traditionally the ammonia in stale urine. By doing this, we add excess electrons to indigo, which turns it into lauco indigo, which is that yellowish green color you've seen if you've ever dyed with indigo or seen someone else dye with indigo, you know, just as you pull it out of the vat before it changes to that brilliant blue. These oxygens right here, they now have a much stronger negative charge than before. Suddenly, all those mildly positively charged hydrogens in water are looking a lot more attractive. Lauco indigo is soluble in water. So now we have our water solubility issue handled. Cotton is a cellulose-based fiber. That is the molecular structure of cellulose right there. 
the brackets and the n here means that the real structure is actually a long chain of these on repeat. But the important thing to notice is how cotton also has several of these oxygen and hydrogen groups that we saw in indigo. It is stable, but it has the potential to interact with other molecules. So when we introduce our cotton fiber to the Lauco indigo dye vat, they are attracted to one another. Specifically for indigo and cotton, they are bonding through what we call hydrogen bonding, which is one of a couple different types of intermolecular interactions or chemistry that happens between molecules, but doesn't change the molecule themselves. So while hydrogen bonding is not strong enough to change either indigo or cellulose into a different molecule, it's more of a case where negatively charged atoms, such as oxygen, are sort of sharing a more positively charged atom, here hydrogens, in order to neutralize everyone's charge and keep everyone happy. Hence, you get these dotted lines rather than whole unbroken lines, which we have between atoms in a molecule. It's a little bit like, you know, how two magnets will stick together if you bring them close enough apart. You can pull them apart again, but they want to hang out. And especially when there are many of these types of, you know, bonds between molecules, all pulling to keep things stuck together. So Leuco Indigo wants to be friend with cellulose in cotton. Cool. But the absolutely mind-numbingly brilliant part of this process comes when we add cotton to the alkaline solution that makes Leuco Indigo possible. If we zoom out from the molecular level you asked about for just a moment and look at cellulose through a scanning electron microscope, which is still, you know, very, very small, we see that cotton fibers twist into a spiral naturally. But when cotton is treated with a strong alkali, we disrupt this structure and straighten it out, which means that there is physically more space for indigo to bind to the cellulose. And when we pull our cotton out of the dye vat, provided the alkali is not so strong as to permanently change the cotton fibers, the Lauco indigo oxidizes with the oxygen in the air and turns back into brilliant blue indigo, while the cotton fiber curls back in on itself, hiding a lot of that glorious blue in folds that are difficult to access and wash out. So we have physical and chemical properties in this case, helping us out on this one. And since we are yet again back to indigo as opposed to Lauco indigo, which is very much not water soluble and laundry detergents are not strong enough of an alkali compared to the dye vats we need for the job, so the indigo stays that way. And while indigo is insoluble in water and content to just chill out, there is some negative charge close to the oxygens which I talked about before. Not as much as with Lauco indigo, but enough that it stays close together with the hydrogens in it is sharing with cellulose and doesn't break away once it returns to its indigo state. Safely nestled within folds of curling cotton fibers. So cool. Next, we have a mordant example. And I promise you, it is just as cool as our indigo example. Our friend for this demonstration is alizarin, one of the dye chemicals at work when using matter roots. It is also the first natural dye to be produced synthetically in, back in 1869. Alizarin is moderately, but not terribly soluble in water. There she is. And it's not because alizarin changes color dramatically when dissolved that she is so pale. It is because we can't get very much out of our red powder to dissolve at all. But again, just like the indigo example, we can use alkalis like wood ash or stale urine, which is sodium and potassium hydroxide and ammonia respectively, to manipulate that. 
Some examples also use acids, but in either case you are taking the pH and either going towards alkali, so higher pH, or a lower pH in order to change the molecular molecule a little bit and make it more eager to react with other things. So yeah, now our alizarin molecule is water soluble. Fantastic. But even if alizarin will bind to textile fibers in this form, it will wash out again and be reduced by, you know, the UV of sunlight and so it will not last very long. We need something else to help us. Enter the mordants. I'm going to talk about metal mordants here because they are the most common when plant dyeing. These are metal salts. For alum, the most common mordant, which is potassium alum sulfate, you have one potassium ion and one aluminium ion per two sulfate ions. When this salt is dissolved in water, you get free potassium and aluminium ions floating about in the solution. The aluminium ion is the one we want in this case. There are a lot of other metal mordants too, giving us access to other metal ions in water solutions such as chromium, tin, iron and copper. And if you do any plant dyeing, you most likely know this already, at least I hope you do, but these metal salts are the reason all the plant dyeing books tell you to have a separate set of pots and pans for dyeing. No cooking in the dye vat. Alum is pretty safe, but the rest of these are pretty unfriendly, if not downright toxic. But back to our aluminium ion. It binds with our negative alizarin molecule and creates an aluminium alizarin complex, a chelate, which has this beautiful warm red leaning on orange color. This aluminium alizarin complex is a whole lot more stable than alizarin alone, and the aluminium also holds on far more strongly to the oxygen groups of our plant fiber and the alizarin molecules compared to the hydrogen bonding I talked about earlier. This also makes alizarin unwilling to hang out with water again, so we have achieved the second necessity, which is convincing our dye molecule that the textile fiber is a lot more attractive. Than water. And together, aluminium, alizarin, make sure your clothes stay red. But wait, there's more! In addition to rendering our dye stuffs insoluble again, metal complexes do cool things, and the same dye stuff, combined with a different metal mordant, can produce slightly different colors. If alizarin is combined with a chromium salt instead, the way the alizarin molecule sort of, you know, bends in 3D space is ever so slightly different. So the wavelengths they bounce back to our eyes is changed as a result. And we get instead a red that lacks those subtle orange undertones we saw when alizarin was combined with aluminium. And there are Tons of examples on how different metal mordants changed colors of a dye like this. This specifically is also known as alizarin crimson and is a common paint pigment. And chromium salts are not friendly. Hexavalent chromium is very not friendly. Please don't lick your paintbrushes. But that's an aside. We can see this with other pigments too. And we do actually have a paper on the effects of different mordants on the pigments in the outer skin of yellow onion on silk fabric. And I mean, outside of published paper, I know so many, you know, diligent plant dyers who have the most marvelous and detailed dye journals filled with their own samples of similar and very diligent, you know, exceptionally meticulous experiments. They were just so cool. And this diagram follows the some rule of thumb guidelines that I've heard plant dyers talk about before. Commonly, prepared to alum, iron darkens, while tin brightens. These were just two examples of the intermolecular forces at play when dyes interact with textile fibers. 
There are a lot more details than this. There is a whole group of mordants that are not metal based, such as tannins, which are popular for tanning leather, and a whole field dedicated to biomordants and enzymes, because the toxicity of metal salts is well known, and when you are dyeing anything on an industrial scale, this can quickly become a big problem. But I think that is quite enough for now. As always, sources and references for these shenanigans can be found in the description box below. If you wish to submit a question to ask textile history, I have built a Discord community server where you may do so. This is also a place where I am continuously gathering and sharing resources for various creative endeavors for the use and inspiration of our members. We encourage you to make things and Honestly, I don't really care what that is, if it's textile arts, or sewing, or fiber arts, or painting, or drawing, or writing, like, just, just create stuff. It, like, just do stuff that you are enthusiastic about, because we know that, especially for physical arts and physical creations, that hand-to-brain connection is really important for healthy human beings. So, as a group, we are also staunchly against toxic perfectionism in all its forms. Striving for excellence is something else entirely, and you can do that at your leisure. And, you know, we want you to just dive in and just do the thing. If that sounds like something you are into, come join us. The link for that is also in the description box below. Thank you for watching, and stay curious. Bye. Are you gonna take up the entire camera? Hmm? Don't eat my microphone, please. It's not kitty snack. Can we do this without the microphone dying again? You are being very snuggly, darling. Are you feeling neglected? Huh? Hmm? Okay. Do you want to tell them about how indigo molecules change and fasten onto our textiles?